Um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit about the research that we've got going on at Georgia Tech, both in my group as well as in other groups. I'm going to try to keep the talk mostly high level, but for those who are chemists or chemical engineers in the audience, I'm going to also try to have about 10 or 15 minutes of um, some hardcore science and engineering for you as well. So I'm going to talk about direct air capture, which I'll refer to as DAC in this talk, uh, which I believe is going to be chemical engineering's contribution uh, to a grand societal challenge that all of you have mobilized to, to hear about and, and to work around. Let's see if I can get my remote to work. All right. So I'm going to start by introducing you to where, where I live and work, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it's a short plane ride away if you want to come and visit, but if you do take that plane, you should recognize that's going to be the largest carbon footprint activity that you're going to do probably in, in that month. Um, I'm fortunate to work at Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech's got a very strong college of engineering, both at the graduate and undergraduate level. Many of the people in this room are mentors to young people who are interested in STEM, or you, some of you may be students or postdocs here as well. When you're done innovating here at, uh, um, in Reno, we would be uh, very happy to see you in Atlanta. My particular program in uh, chemical engineering uh, is one of the largest chemical engineering programs in, in the country. Um, has about 40 faculty, uh, 200 PhD students, and about 800 undergraduates. It's going to take me a moment to figure out how to get this to work. I'm going to point it over here. Okay. All right. All right. My finger is now working. All right, so I'm going to start with a big picture message, and it's a message that I hope you will see as a message of hope. Um, and that message is that we have solved big problems in the past, problems that are the same scale as the climate change problem. Um, unfortunately, I would argue that the climate change problem that our generation of scientists and engineers are now tasked with tackling is a direct consequence of this previous problem that was solved. And so um, if we yeah, I'm going to need someone to help me with this. It's not working. Let's see. I can, see, I can see it over there. I also can give you another remote if you want. But. OK, well, I know what to do now. I'm going to come closer. So this is good. It'll allow me to move. So if we, if we take a step back in time to 1900, and we imagine a similar gathering like we, we are here today, talking about the grand challenge of the time. You know, what would that challenge have been? What would we have read about in the front page of the New York Times or, or heard in mass media? And it would have been famine. So at the time of 1900, if you look at the grand challenges of the day, they were looking for a food solution. And, and the reason why is in the late 1800s, every year there were famines that were killing on the order of millions of people. And so this is a, an example where scientists and engineers came together, and they did, in fact, develop the solution. And that solution was from Haber and Bosch, wh who took nitrogen from the air, uh, were able to synthesize ammonia synthetically, and thereby massively increase the production of fertilizer. So this was a 20, 30-year research journey across multiple countries. Haber and Bosch, in particular, worked in Germany. Prior to Haber and Bosch, we mined uh, fertilizer primarily in the form of nitrates from South America and Chile, uh, and it was very expensive. And if we look at the cost, they would drop by $45 a ton pre Haber Bosch to less than $20 a ton post Haber Bosch. And really, what that did is that fueled a population boom. So if we look at the historical record, all right, I'm getting, it, I'm getting, I'm getting the hang of it now, folks. Um, if we look at the horse historical record before uh, Haber-Bosch, from 1650 to 1900, it took about 250 years for the world population to triple. But then Haber-Bosch comes around, we solve the, the problem of being able to feed humanity, and now we have a fourfold growth in population in 100 years. So I cite this example because of two things. One, it shows you that when science is well-funded and we tackle a problem with uh, all of our might, we can be successful and we can fundamentally change the way the planet looks. Uh, but also, all those people that the world now holds, I was at the Davidson Academy today and I asked the students there how many people are on Earth and they immediately told me it was more than 8 billion now. Um, that is uh, because of Haber-Bosch and they're all using energy. So all that energy that they have used now has created the current grand challenge that we're working on, which is climate change. 
So if there's five big picture messages that I'd like to leave you with, um, the first, uh, I've already mentioned, scientists and engineers solve problems, but sometimes we create new ones. The good news is that history shows that science can respond in a rapid and focused way when it's resourced. And examples I'll give you will be the Manhattan Project in the 1940s, the Moonshot in the 1960s, and the Human Genome Initiative in the 1990s. All examples of big scientific endeavors that fundamentally changed the course of humanity. I will argue that climate change is the defining challenge of our current era, and we collectively will be judged by history based on how effectively we tackle this problem. One of the solutions is negative emissions technologies. So here's another acronym that I'm gonna throw at you, NETS, negative emissions technologies that I'm gonna use throughout the talk. There's no single technology that's going to solve our problem. It's gonna require innovations across an array of different spaces. One of those NETS that I think is very important is direct air capture. The reason why it's important is it's essentially infinitely scalable. So a lot of the other NETS that we can use that I'll tell you about are, are excellent and they're low cost, but they don't scale very well. And we've waited so long to envision CO2 as a pollutant, like we would envision other things that we would spill in the soil, water, or air, that we now have literally 100 plus years of CO2 in the atmosphere that we have to clean up. So we need to do two things. And you would have heard about this in the first talk. I'm gonna to touch on it again briefly. The first is to reduce carbon sources. So this includes nuclear, wind, solar, more efficient devices, and point source carbon capture and sequestration. So going to large point sources like uh, oil, coal, or gas-fired installations, power plants, refineries, capturing CO2 from those. That produces a product that we're gonna call avoided emissions. If we imagine filling a bathtub with CO2, where the bathtub is our atmosphere, this is slowing the rate at which we're putting more CO2 into the bathtub. But then in parallel with this, we need to have uh, negative emissions. Let's first pause to think about what uh, um, uh, avoided emissions in the form of carbon capture looks like. So we're gonna do CO2 capture from a point source. That's represented by the CO2 barrel in the center of this slide. Um, if we couple this with ge geologic storage shown here, we are going to have carbon capture and sequestration. The technology exists for us to do this today from point sources. We have been doing this in the oil and gas industry for decades. And if we do this on a wider scale, it's going to slow the pace of worsening climate change. But just like switching to wind and solar now is not enough, carbon capture from point sources is also not enough because we have to deal with those legacy emissions that nets can in fact address. So enhancing carbon sinks is the deployment of negative emissions technologies or nets. And I was fortunate to be part of this uh, uh, panel in 2018 that published this consensus study report on negative emissions technologies using land-based methods. And this is a fundamentally different product from avoided emissions. Here we're talking about negative emissions technologies. And one of these negative emissions technologies that's very important uh, is direct air capture. So what are these negative emissions technologies, these things that take CO2 out of the air? Well, they're an array of different technologies, some of which you might not even think of as a technology. They're really land management approaches. So how you manage your coastal ecosystems where carbon is stored, sometimes referred to as coastal blue carbon. Or on the right-hand side here, how you manage your forests and your farmlands such that you can store more carbon in soils. These are great approaches because they leverage natural processes. Uh, they're also typically very cheap. They could be 10 or 20 or $30 per ton uh, ways to, cap to capture and store CO2. However, they don't scale very well. And as I'm gonna show you in the coming slides, by mid-century, we need to get 10 gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere every year going forward. So to get a, get a feeling for how big that is, that's roughly one quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions today, which is on the order of 40 gigatons per year. Every year for the rest of this century, starting in 2050, we gotta be taking one quarter of that amount out of the atmosphere. And that's a massive number, and these natural approaches don't scale to make that possible. But the approaches that are in the red box, including working on different ways of doing carbon mineralization with the appropriate types of rocks, or taking chemical processes that take CO2 out of the air via direct air capture, effectively are infinitely scalable. However, they have scientific questions that are not well, uh, well resolved in the case of mineralization, or cost questions in the case of direct air capture. So direct air capture today costs about $500 per ton if you go and talk to the startup companies. The target to actually make this a, a viable part of our energy ecosystem is to get that down below $200 a ton with a target of reaching $20 per ton, I mean, sorry, $100 per ton as soon as we can. 
So this is probably similar to a plot you might have seen in the last lecture if you came to the last lecture. If we consider how large is the potential market for nets likely to be, or equivalently how much carbon is needed to meet the Paris Agreement goals, uh, you can see that summarized on this slide. So this is a plot in, of emissions in gigatons per year as a function of time. And we are basically at the apex point of this red line. And if we continue our business as usual and we make no changes to our activities, we'll hit a maximum amount of emissions uh, sometime in mid-century, and we'll certainly warm to three or four degrees C warming, which could be catastrophic for certain regions around, around the world. To get to something that's near two degrees C or below two degrees C, instead we would have to follow a line that's represented by that red line. And that red line uh, crosses to zero emissions late in the century. Um, but also includes bringing on a new type of technology shown in blue at the bottom. So this new technology, these negative emissions technologies, start around 2030, and by mid-century reach, reach about 10 gigatons per year, and by later in the century reach about 20 gigatons per year. And um, we can see that that's a huge, huge ask to create a new industry from nothing that is roughly 25% the size of the 2020 fossil fuel industry, which we developed over 120 years. Uh, we want to do that in 30 years. That's a huge ask, starting from a, a nascent state that we're in today. And so that's the challenge that we, we need to uh, undertake if we want to uh, effectively control our climate. We're not going to do all 10 gigatons by direct air capture or 20 gigatons by direct air capture. This is going to be five or 10 different technologies. But to get to a number that large, something that's scalable like direct air capture is going to need to be a component of it. So let's think about the act of taking CO2 out of the air. As you might imagine, this is something we already know how to do, right? We've had submarines for almost the entire 20th century. We've had spacecraft and space stations for the last 50 years. So we know how to take CO2 out of the air. There's technologies that exist that do that quite well. Um, those are pretty high cost tolerant industries, right? The Navy's willing to spend a lot of money to keep their sailors safe. Same with NASA and their astronauts. We're not talking about dealing with that level of cost as, as, as a requirement. We have to be much, much cheaper than that. So the thought to first do this as a way to combat climate change really uh, gets credited to Klaus Lackner, who's now at Arizona State. At the time, he was at Los Alamos. Um, he proposed large-scale direct air capture as a climate change mitigation methodology. And for about 10 years, not much work was done. There was a little bit of talk uh, amongst academics in the literature. But by the end of the uh, 20 aughts to 28 to 2010 was the first temperature vacuum swing adsorption direct air capture companies that were formed. Um, I was collaborating with one of the first three companies that did that called Global Thermostat. And so in 2008, 2009, Global Thermostat's process was married with some sorbents that we developed at Georgia Tech. About 2010, I went to DOE and ETL and advocated for funding in this space uh, as an emerging area of carbon capture. It wasn't really viewed to be uh, a viable topic at that time because it was so new. Indeed, it had only existed for 10 years and very few people were working on it. Uh, we wrote the first review in that area on that topic in 2011, and then further in 2011, an American Physical Society report came out that said, stop, stop the presses, don't do any of this, it's going to be impossible, it's not a good idea. Um, and I don't agree with that uh, decision from the American Physical Society report, although you can clearly understand um, how they arrived at that decision if you, if you, read, their, if you read their approach. So it took about five years for additional R&D by many groups around the world to build up a comprehensive data set in the, letter, in the literature that I think was sufficient to convince people that this, in fact, could be a viable technology. And in 2018, the Negative Emissions National Academy study that I was a part of really um, set the tone for all of the funding that we see coming online today. And so Georgia Tech has played a really big part of this. So we got involved in the very early days. And if we look at the most recent review, which was published in December of last year, which now is up to 550 references on direct air capture, 20% of those are from GT researchers or from Georgia Tech alums. So we're really proud of this area uh, of development at Georgia Tech. So I co-wrote the direct air capture section in this report uh, with Jen Wilcox, who's a very important person in the US Department of Energy. She's now the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Fossil Energy. And I point this out because it's really important that STEM experts go and do policy as well. And so we're all lucky that there's someone who is like us, a chemist or a chemical engineer, who knows the hard science and engineering, who's now doing the necessary policy work in order to champion uh, net funding and net deployment, deployment as part of federal policy. 
And so it took about 10 years of lobbying and convincing, but now we have multi-billion dollar programs coming out of DOE. Um, and so for those of you who are working on new areas yourself, and if it's taking a long time for things to get traction, just keep working at it and working at it. And if it is, it, if it is in fact an idea that merits some traction, there is hope that uh, funding will come. So we've developed a center at Georgia Tech that we've named after the physicist Paul Dirac. Probably most scientists know this name. Um, Dirac was actually one of the per first physicists to think about the thermodynamics of dilute mixture separations. And so he's actually a, a suitable person to name uh, the center after, as well as um, uh, we can make a nice acronym based on his name. And every academic knows that the most successful centers are those that have the best names and, and acronyms. Of course, that's in jest. So um, there's a number of uh, uh, folks who I've had the opportunity to work with who are now leading in this space. Many of them are based out here on the West Coast. Global Thermostats R&D labs are in Brighton, Colorado. Miles, Steph, and Eric are all working at Global Thermostat. Simon Pang is a leading CCS researcher at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, an, an alum of the University of Colorado who did a postdoc with me. And then Mika Taborga um, is a former ExxonMobil uh, person who ran their direct air capture program. Um, as part of the team of people at Exxon who did that, who's now working for Repsol in Spain. And so I'm um, very happy to have those folks out there uh, working on these materials. So if you've never seen a gas separation process before, I have a simple cartoon that I want you to look at to understand what exactly we're doing when we capture CO2 from the air. Um, th in this cartoon, we've got exhaust from combustion or from, from the air that we're going to go ahead and pass through a, a, a contactor. And that contactor is going to take, contain either a liquid or a solid material that's been engineered to selectively bind CO2. Remember, CO2 in air is 0.04% of the air, so you really need to go in and pick out those individual molecules. So red is uh, rep representing CO2. All of the non-CO2 in air or flue gas is represented by the green. And so we'll go ahead and pass that through to a suitable contactor. It'll occur at low temperature. That contactor will then capture the CO2 on the sorbent material and will emit from flue gas maybe exhaust with 90% of the CO2 removed. And so this is the same for flue gas capture at a point source and for direct air capture. CO2 absorption is spontaneous and exothermic. So we don't have to do anything special to make this happen. We just have to contact the air with the sorbent. The expensive step in this carbon capture process is the regeneration step. The re regeneration step is uh, uh, endothermic, and that's where we have to put energy and money into the system. So both DAC and post-combustion capture are essentially the same from the adsorption side. Okay, and then so then we desorb by bringing heat into the system or vacuum or some acids are not very enthalpically favored, so you don't get a very large surface coverage of these uh, carbamic acids. But if you keep bringing more and more amines in higher and higher density, eventually you get uh, carbamic acids that are close enough to a second amine as shown on the bottom. And when you get that second amine in close proximity, it can deprotonate that carbamic acid, and then you form an alkylammonium carbamate, where you have a carbamate attached to one amine, and the second amine is a base that accepts a proton. And this is very heavily enthalpically favored. And so the high uptake capacities that we get we can see from this nonlinear uh, factor with the coverage of, um, of amine sites, as well as from in situ IR spectroscopy, is associated with forming these alkylammonium, alkylammonium carbamates. We can now turn our attention then to the heats absorption associated with each of these, and we can see that at low amine coverage, we're essentially only doing physisorption. At intermediate amine coverages, we're mostly uh, capturing in the form of carbamic acids. And then we can get relatively high heat absorption on the order of minus 95 kilojoules per mole if we get a high enough of density of amines to give us uh, alkylammonium carbamates. And then we get a very high uptake and a steep adsorption curve, which is what we need for practical application. So now we have uh, additional design elements, right? So we know we want primary amines, and we want to have a high density of primary amines. We can then go ahead and test the hypothesis I showed you earlier. And that hypothesis I showed you earlier was that primary amines are more effective than secondary amines, in this case, the methyl aminopropyl. And we're going to add in one more secondary amine, the n-butyl aminopropyl. And the hypothesis was that the red was more effective than the blue because it had a stronger driving force for adsorption in the form of a more negative enthalpy of adsorption. Well, if we look at the heat of adsorption for all of three of these materials, even though they have different shaped isotherms, the heat of adsorption within air are the same. 
So what we calculated with what we were taught in our undergraduate thermodynamics class uh, turned out to be wrong in this case. We can't ascribe the imp improved performance of the primary amines to enthalpic reasons, and if it's not enthalpy, then of course, what's it gotta be? It's entropy. And the way we rationalize this is most adsorbent materials are rigid fixed surfaces, a carbon, a silica, and alumina, and so the entropy of the sorbent really doesn't change at all during the adsorption process. But our materials have dynamic binding sites. We have amines tethered to the surface that are moving all over the place. And in order to form uh, an alkyl ammonium carbamate, you gotta have one amine that grabs the CO2 and the other amine that's nearby to grab a proton. So this is a cooperative interaction. It's a two amines capturing one CO2. And in order to do that, and, uh, entropic constraints can be a real problem. So when this is a primary amine, getting this NH out of the way so you can form this alkyl ammonium carbamate is relatively easy. But if this now becomes a second amine chain, a methyl group or a butyl group, there's now an entropic barrier to getting that out of the way such that you can find this, the, uh, the second um, amine to form uh, the alkyl ammonium carbamate. So there's this entropic barrier that a secondary amine has to get around in order to form the alkyl ammonium carbamate. And that's why we think primary amines are more effective than secondary amines. So now we have a bunch of design elements that we can go to use to design what we think might be more effective amine molecules. And I've had a variety of different folks in my group working on this over the years. So we know we want primary amines, we know we want them in high density, um, and we also want them to be very stable. Uh, how many people are chemists or chemical engineers who have worked with uh, amines in their labs before? Can you raise your hand? And, and do they last forever in, in, your, in your chemical safety cabinet? Uh, do they stink sometimes? Do they degrade by oxidation? So one of the other problems we have is we have to make sure we design amines that are as stable to oxidation as possible because we're gonna be using this out in the air, right? Exposing it to uh, ambient conditions. And so PEI is the benchmark that everybody uses because it's commercially available and it works well, but it oxidizes slowly. PPI is more oxidatively robust and we've made it in both linear and branched forms. And we've made uh, PPI and PEI versions where we have aromatic groups in order to space out the amines. We've put amines on the backbone of linear polymers like polyglycidylamine, uh, as well as simple radical polymers based on polyalulamine, all of which work reasonably well compared to um, the PEI parent materials. Okay, so I did my deep dive on number two, which is designing the binding site. I now wanna talk about three, four, and five as we work our way towards the end of the presentation with essentially only one slide on, on, on most of these different topics. So we've got an adsorbent that can effectively grab CO2 effectively. Now we need to cycle it on and off as quickly as possible. And if we, we can do that in part by having this high, uh, high flow, low pressure drop contactor, because as I told you before, one ton of CO2 removal at 70% capture means we have to process 3,500 tons of air. So in a lot of our lab scale testing, we'll use a thermal gravimetric analyzer. This is essentially a balance that's in a furnace, and we can measure how long does it take to absorb a certain amount of CO2. This is a normalized capacity where one is pseudo-equilibrium. So you can see that for air, which is 400 parts per million, we would stop after we exit the quasi-linear regime of the uptake, which in the laboratory occurs after about 100 minutes. So 100 minutes is too long for a practical absorption cycle in industry, but that's what we get in a TGA with the non-optimal flow patterns. We would not take this out to pseudo-equilibrium because all this time wasted getting only a small amount of uptake would not be wise. Instead, we stop in this regime here where we get to, say, 80% of the equilibrium uptake after 100 minutes. Well, that same 80%, if you put it in the, a good contactor that's not a TGA, instead of taking 100 minutes, uh, takes on the order of 15 minutes. So if you put it in a monolith contactor, like shown here on the bottom right, you can get adsorption uh, in a 15 minute cycle. And then if you have a rapid way to heat it, you can get desorption even faster. And so the startup companies are tar targeting roughly a 20 or 30 minute cycle, whereby you would do adsorption for 15 minutes and desorption for about five minutes. So how can you get that rapid heat transfer necessary in order to get the CO2 off as quickly as possible? So amine adsorption is going to occur at ambient temperatures, typically minus 20 to 40 degrees C, depending on where you are in the globe. And then you wanna have a small delta T for regeneration on the order of 40 to 80 degrees C. Uh, and there's two preferred modes that you can use to de de deploy that rapid heating. 
One way that we prefer at Georgia Tech is direct stream steam stripping, and the second way is via a dual heating. There's obviously a lot of other ways you can do it as well, but those are the two we prefer at Georgia Tech. So steam stripping with saturated steam is one of the fastest ways you can do heat transfer. Heat of condensation of steam onto a sorbent material uh, can give you very, very rapid heat transfer. So we'll take our sorbent, which if you remember earlier was yellow with trapped CO2 in the form of red. We're going to go ahead and pass steam over that. Steam will condense on the surface and it will provide two driving forces for desorption. One is the heat, the rapid heat conduction into the sorbent based on the steam condensation. And the second is the change in partial pressure. Right, so now we're diluting the, um, the concentration of CO2 over the material. Once we have a steam CO2 mixture, that's a relatively easy mixture to separate by condensation. Uh, you can condense out the, the steam, recycle it, and then you have essentially a pure CO2 stream. This requires a very robust sorbent. So for those of you who remember what I talked about earlier for my sorbents, I, in the lab I use a lot of silica and, and, and amines. A silica and an, and an amine and steam makes mush. So that's not what you would do uh, at scale, you've got to use a more robust uh, metal oxide, and so we typically would use an aluminosilicate or an alumina that can withstand that sort of steaming. The second approach, what we've developed more recently, and this is really due to the expertise of my colleague Ryan Lively, is to do dual heating. So we all hear about how we're going to have all this free electricity at certain times of the, of the year when renewable energy is so efficient. I don't really believe that, by the way, but it's nice that we have low-cost uh, electricity. And if we do, and if we want to use electricity for desorption, we can do that by dual heating. So rather than making a polymeric fiber with silica particles in it, um, we could take a carbon fiber, coat it with our sorbent layer, in this case cellulose acetate with silica particles, put amines in there, and then we can rapidly heat from 20 degrees C to 120 degrees C in a matter of a minute or less by joule heating, by putting a voltage across that carbon fiber. And compared to a typical temperature swing adsorption, which gives you a broad curve of CO2 that's released, you can probably barely even see the blue curve in the back. The red curve with electric swing adsorption is a very sharp pulse. So we can get a very high concentration of CO2 off very quickly with joule heating if we have a, a sorbent that's uh, robust enough to heating up to, say, 90 degrees C and, and then cooled back down uh, very, very rapidly. So you've got to have a way to rapidly heat and cool in order to cycle this material quickly. So the last element, number five on the list, is acceptable capital cost and ultra-long process material lifetime. And here, sorbent degradation and lifetime is a critical element. So amines are not going to last forever in, uh, in exposed to atmosphere, certainly not with temperature swings involved. So I've worked with a startup company that I told you about earlier, Global Thermostat. They originally had their R&T labs at Georgia Tech and then moved them in 2020 during the pandemic to Brighton, Colorado. The Georgia Tech lawyers require me to give this conflict of interest statement that says that I receive research funding from them, they've licensed IP for me, I have a financial interest in the company, so that if, ever, if they ever make a billion dollars, I'll make 50 cents. And uh, this is the first generation unit they built in Menlo Park, California in uh, 2011 at SRI. This is the third generation unit that was built in 2018 in Huntsville, Alabama. And the fourth generation was, is uh, being unveiled in March in Brighton, Colorado. So what does a process look like for one of these direct air capture approaches? We've got uh, five steps in a cycle, and we do adsorption in the first step. We would then close off the, the, the system to airflow and evacuate it to remove interstitial air around the adsorbent materials. We can then inject steam into the system, heating up the system and desorbing CO2 collecting the CO2, closing it off again and cooling it back down to a suitably low temperature, at which point we can open it up to airflow again and continue to absorb CO2. So we've done a techno-economic analysis and published it in the bottom paper here with my colleague Matthew Ralph, who's a systems engineer. Uh, we used a moth-containing uh, sorbent, MIL-101 chromium, containing PEI on a monolith contactor. We did that because we had to use something different from what the, the startup company does. And we can calculate the, the cycle time, the energy used, and the energy is about 0.15 megajou megajoules per mole CO2, which is above the thermodynamic minimum. It's always good to, check, to, to go ahead and check that. We intend to try to scale out this technology by mass manufacture. So one way that companies are envisioning deploying this is with essentially shipping container-sized units that would be parallelized and deployed uh, across, across the country. And the biggest unknown is the lifetime of the amine sorbents. 
and we know that amines are not stable indefinitely in air. So we've also spent a lot of time studying the oxidation of amines and understanding the mechanism of oxidation and how we can inhibit that. We can go back into the old literature and see that it's, all of our data are consistent with, with, with what's referred to as the basic auto-oxidation scheme, which is a radical abstraction of CH bonds of a polymer. And we've recently published a paper on the chemical kinetics of the auto-oxidation of PEI along with a startup company, calculating a reaction order in O2 of about 0.5 to 0.7 and an apparent activation energy of 105 kilojoules per mole for the oxidation, the degradation of these amines. And so using these kinetic parameters, we can now extrapolate how long a, an amine formulation will last in the field based on how it behaves in the laboratory. And the way it degrades is we're seeing an increase in the carbon-nitrogen ratio under all conditions. That means we're breaking carbon-nitrogen bonds when it degrades. And we're seeing a reduction of the H over C plus N uh, elemental ratio which means we're also breaking CH bonds. So these radical reactions are attack, attacking CH bonds and CN bonds. And so this uh, alpha carbon next to the, uh, the nitrogen group is a, is a relatively acidic CH bond, and that bond can be uh, abstracted. Um, we can react with oxygen to create peroxo or uh, hydroperoxo type intermediates, and we can draw different pathways that produce imine groups, that produce carbonyl groups, and then ultimately they give off ammonia and CO2 as the final products for degradation, all of which we have detected in the laboratory. And so we're getting down now to the level where we're beginning to understand the elementary steps of these uh, degradation reactions, but then sh which then should allow us to design more robust sorbents. And something as simple as putting one more methylene between the two nitrogens goes a long way to making these materials more oxidatively stable. Okay, so all five of these elements we've demonstrated on the, in the lab. Um, there's a couple that have the most room for improvement. I think those are four and five, minimizing the energy of desorption and increasing the lifetime of the sorbent materials. But I'm gonna finish up with what I think is the current cool topic that we're working on in my group. The sixth critical element that really not enough people are talking about, and this is the technological flexibility. So this is a technology that we're gonna optimize differently from almost all chemical technologies that we might have dreamt of. So if you imagine a chemical technology whereby you're gonna create, convert crude oil into naphtha and intermediates for chemical synthesis, polymer synthesis, we can optimize that in our laboratories wherever we're working, and then we're gonna deploy it under the same conditions in, in France, in Brazil, in Saudi Arabia, and in Texas. Right, we'll optimize it for that one set of conditions, and within a little bit of wiggle room, we're gonna operate it under those conditions. Direct air capture is definitely not that. You're gonna have a changing feed in real time. It could be raining in the morning, hot and sunny in the afternoon. It can be winter, it can be summer. It can be, um, think about what January in Reno is compared to what July in Reno is, right? Very, very different. And then even in a single day, you could have five degrees C or, and then 25 degrees C later in the day. And your process has to work under all of those conditions. And so we are probably gonna imagine a process with real-time sensing of temperature relative humidity, and you might be, have a process where you're changing the cycles in real time depending on the weather. And what this means, in my view, is that you're not ever gonna have a single DAC solution that dominates everything. Because I think there's gonna be different solutions that operate in different climates. So a DAC solution that might work in the Reno climate is not gonna probably work in the Miami climate. And so there's real opportunities for many different types of innovations to be actually deployed and used uh, if you can optimize it for a certain set of conditions. So if we look at the average temperature around the world as a function of uh, location, we can see that there's definitely hot zones. And if you look in the literature, all of the data on DAC are in this temperature region that I would call ambient. And it makes sense, right? So ambient, I'm defining as starting at 20 degrees C. That's indoor room temperature. That's where our labs are. Of course, that's where we're gonna be taking data. But actually, if you look throughout the year in the different regions in the US, south, southwest, northwest, a large fraction of the year, the average temperature is below 20 degrees C. And in this region, there's almost no data in the literature about what types of materials work well and what types of materials um, don't work well. And so I think there's a huge opportunity uh, to work in this region. And in particular, I think the most promising region for a DAC is actually uh, working in colder climates. And for me, the optimal place to deploy would be somewhere like uh, Calgary, Alberta in Canada, 
where you have a workforce that understands chemistry and chemical engineering, you have geology that allows you to store CO2 underground, and you have the driving force of cold temperatures driving adsorption. So we can think about working in cold temperatures, and in fact, it might actually allow you to use technologies that we previously thought wouldn't, won't work at all. So remember I started the talk on sorbents telling you why zeolites won't work. Zeolites are fizzy sorbents, and they have a hard time distinguishing between water and CO2. So if you have a humid day at 25 degrees C, you have almost 32,000 parts per million of water in the air. And if you have that much water and only 400 parts per million of CO2, capturing the CO2 and not the water is going to be a huge problem. But if you go to cold temperatures, say minus 20 degrees C, you're now down an order of magnitude in water content, even at the, at the dew point. So we're at down to about 1,240 parts per million. So I think cold temperatures and climates offer many possible advantages, including favorable thermodynamics for adsorption, weaker, which enables you to use weaker CO2 binding. If you have weaker CO2 binding, it's less energy to regenerate the sorbent, and most importantly, less competition from water. So we did a simple study, just a thermodynamic calculation by one of my second year engineering students. It was a good opportunity to, for him to do some very basic work. Let's imagine we're capturing CO2 from air at 25 degrees C using zeolites, and it's a humid day. The amount of energy it takes to regenerate the water off the sorbent compared to the amount of CO2 that you capture is way higher, maybe a factor of three or four higher just to get the water off the sorbent compared to the CO2. But if you do this um, at cold temperatures, because there's so little water in the airstream, now you might be able to be able to use two beds. So we could use a desiccant bed to remove the water, and then a second bed of zeolite uh, to remove the CO2. And we think at cold temperatures, you can use zeolites. And why is that important? Because zeolites have an existing supply chain that you can go and buy now and deploy now. A lot of those fancy amines that I showed you earlier that we spent years trying to make, they work. But it's probably going to be 10 years before I can get a company to make them on the ton scale. Zeolites you can go buy on the ton scale tomorrow. Just bring your checkbook. So uh, to give you an example of how the different temperatures and conditions uh, matter, I'm going to give you this last little element. And this is where we used a MIL 101 MOF with amines in it. And previously, we studied at 25 degrees C and showed that they captured CO2 very well. And I just asked the simple question, would it be different if we now deployed this material at minus 20 instead of 25 degrees C? And so here's a plot of the capacity in moles per kilogram as a function of uh, amine loading. And at um, 25 degrees C, the performance is that it gets better at higher amine loadings. Remember the nonlinear performance of amine site density with, with respect to CO2 uptake? The more amines you put on, the better it behaved. That's why we have this concave shape as we go to higher amine loadings. But now if we go to minus 20 degrees C, we have a totally different behavior. You get an optimal performance at a lower amine loading, which is uh, below what you get at 25 degrees C. But the take home message is that you would use a different sorbent in the winter from what you would use in the summer if you were to deploy this family of materials. And this is why I think climatic zone is going to be important going forward. So I'm going to finish by answering the two questions that everybody always asks me so that therefore no one will ask me. The first one is, how much land do we need to do this? So I've heard other energy technologies that are really land intensive. And so I did a back of the envelope calculation. So let's imagine that we do the 2060 negative emissions target for the whole globe. So all negative emissions that the globe needs by DAC. I'll begin by saying I hope we never ever do that because DAC is the most expensive net. And if we do the whole world's DAC work with DA, uh, whole world's network with DAC, we're all going to be a lot poorer. Um, but that would be 10 gigatons per year. If we were to do that, based on my connection to the startup company about the land area that's required per ton of CO2. They estimate that total global need would be about 152,000 square kilometers of DAC implementation. That is roughly the size of the state of Georgia. So I'm not arguing that that's a small amount of land, but I'm saying that if that's what we had to do somewhere on the globe in order to stabilize our climate, we could do that. If you consider all the land mass and the wasted land mass that exists around the globe, this is not an intractable amount of land. 
and I'm not volunteering Georgia for this because I quite like living in Georgia. The second question I get is why not use natural systems like trees? And my first answer to that is that as a, as a species, we have not demonstrated the ability to reforest, only deforest. So until there's empirical evidence that shows that we can reforest, I'm a little bit doubtful that we can do this as a, as a society. But let's say even, even if we could, there's, there's something to be said about the direct air capture approach. So let's take a, a best case scenario for, not a best case scenario, a good case scenario for a tree. We'll take a tree at the equator, we'll go into the uh, appropriate literature and we'll calculate the flux of CO2 removal from a tree at the equator and we'll normalize that by the ground area. And if you do that, you'll get a number that's on the order of 20 micromoles per second per meter square to ground area. And then you can do the same calculation for a DAC process and you get a number that's 25 times higher. So from a land use perspective, these uh, DAC plants are much more efficient than a, a tree at the equator. Now I'm not arguing that they're better than a tree at the equator. I would much rather have us do as much of this problem as we can by planting trees and doing natural things, but we can engineer systems that are more efficient per, per square meter of land than, than biological systems. So the technical summary then is that direct air capture is a key scalable net and what makes it important is that it's scalable. And what it makes it not deployable now is it's way too expensive. It's on the order of $500 a ton and we need to get that down to 100 or 200. An element of this technology is a low pressure drop contactor with high capacity sorbents with rapid kinetics and a small delta T. Those are design elements of the process and you need to design the sorbent, the contactor and the process together. This is not a technology that I think is gonna work well by uh, materials people working in isolation from process people. They have to work together. One of the big problems for the sorbents that I have worked on mostly, which are amines, is degradation by oxidation. That has to be managed. But if we can go to low temperatures and use purely inorganic materials like fizzy sorbents, those will be essentially, by comparison, infinitely, uh, have infinite lifetimes. And then there's an overall lack of data at the cold temperatures and in varying humidity where there's a lot of fundamental science that remains to be done. So these were the five points I started with. Uh, the last two are important, is that nets, along with renewable energy, are gonna be the answer. One net, not the only net, is DAC. I wanna acknowledge my senior collaborators on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, my former students who've worked on DAC, my former postdocs who've worked on DAC. Those who are bolded are people whose work I talked about today. They're working all over the, the country and the world now on this topic. And then um, current picture of my group, those who funded me for carbon uh, capture on the right hand side. And any of you who are interested in getting say middle school or high school students interested in a STEM career, I partnered with the Dreyfus Foundation to do a seven minute video on DAC and how it can be um, a society changing, a climate changing technology. You can find the link to that, uh, that short film uh, on that link right there. And so with that, I'm at the point where I'm happy to take any questions. I hope people will stick around for a discussion. It would be really nice to have opportunities for us to all interact and ask questions, and I'm happy to stay as long as necessary to answer as many questions as they are. So I really appreciate everybody's attention. Sorry that I didn't know how to use a remote early on. Um, and uh, thank you again. <laughs>